In this video, we are going to talk about the Great Crash to start March 11th through March 15th. It's now law. Yes, we are going to respond to a YouTube video where basically somebody spends 13 minutes telling you that because the bank term funding program is coming to an expiration on March 11th, we're all screwed and that's exactly why billionaires like Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos, and others are selling, and people like Warren Buffett just this week weekend suggesting that opportunities to outperform are very low right now so he continues to sit on record high levels of cash. Is this possibly because the billionaires know? Yes. Is it likely because of the bank term funding program? No. In this video we're going to describe where the real bubble problems are and I'm going to show you some examples some of which you might actually even be able to make money on as the crash does occur which eventually it will. Let's talk about it in this video. First, let's talk about the bank term funding program. Yes, the bank term funding program is a bank lending facility that comes to an end March 11th. Most people don't understand that when that program comes to an end, it does not mean all of the 164, yep, $164 billion that have been lent come due. That is not true. Only about a third come due within the first quarter after the bank term funding program ends. And it really takes an entire year for that bank term funding program money to come due for banks. One of the places that you can, in my opinion, really watch for that sort of regional stress of how much do we actually think the end of this program is going to affect banks uh, is twofold. Number one, you should look at a, a bank like New York Community Bank, who took massive write downs, allowance for credit losses of almost half a billion dollars because of two, just two buildings in real estate, office, commercial related buildings. Just two properties wrote them down half a billion dollars that destroyed their earnings and their potential for cash flow so heavily uh, that the stock plummeted. Now, in the weeks afterwards, the company said, but don't worry, we are not having a bank run. We're not having outflows. That's probably because, frankly, the U.S. government has sort of insured all deposits in infinity. Sure, we're supposed to be insured up to $250,000 for depositors uh, of, of uh, bank uh, account cash. But the reality is the FDIC insurance limits after the Silicon Valley bust and the essential full-on bailout of the banking system is realistically way higher. So you're not really seeing banking runs exacerbate these issues. As a result, I actually don't think the next crash is a banking-driven crash. That was last year's crash. So what is the crash? Well, I'll give you two crashes coming up. And these are very important to pay attention to. But I just want to finish the point. This is the bank term funding program. Notice how drawdowns on the bank term funding program have actually flattened out. Now, yes, they did rise here. That's because there was a unique arbitrage opportunity. Forget the science behind this. Basically, you were able to borrow money from this program for less than you were able to lend it out for. That was kooky. The Fed stopped that. As soon as the Fed stopped that, you got one last little push here of borrowing, and then you had a drop. Uh, and, or a flattening, we should call this. I don't really call that much of a drop. It's more of a flattening. This is a problem, but I don't think this $164 billion here is so systemically problematic. Uh, and we're not seeing signs that there's this rush towards March 11th. You know, we're, what, two weeks-ish away from March 11th now? Uh, there's not this insane rush of people piling into this facility going, that's it, last chance to get cheap money. There are other ways for banks to get funding, whether it's from the bond market or from the stock market, or quite frankly, it's from the Fed's discount window. You don't need the bank term funding program for everything, okay? So let's put that aside for a moment. Let's instead talk about the other two crashes, and they're in two totally different markets. One uh, has to do with stocks and AI, and the other has to do, quite frankly, with real estate. Let's talk about both of those. So where am I seeing bubbles right now? Well, one of the largest bubbles that I'm seeing right now is ARM. Look, I understand the company's got phenomenal margins selling their infrastructure code bases, you know, and I know I'm going to get a bunch of tech comments on, on uh, describing what ARM is. It doesn't really matter uh, their risk architecture. We don't have to get into that. What matters is that this is a company that is trading for over a four to five peg with 
one entity owning over 90% of the shares of this company and the lockup for this company is set for March 12th, the lockup expiration. That means this is a company that IPO'd and after you IPO, what you do is you have companies that say, hey, you know what? Investors, internal investors say, you know, we will promise not to sell until 180 days after a certain date. Well, that date is right around IPO time, which was in September. So we're looking at March 12th. I believe it's highly likely that this stock will see a very rapid decline, possibly leading into the lockup. And you've got multiple catalysts here. I think you've got a negative catalyst going into the lockup, so leading up to March 12th. So I think you can see a decline before March 12th as traders start pricing it in. I think you could see a further decline during the period after the lockup if SoftBank actually starts selling, which I expect them to, especially if these valuations hold. Or you've got another negative catalyst of March 20th, which is the Fed's release of the summary of economic projections. I think all three of these are going to put A, a lid on this growth, and B, lead to substantial downside. I will say, though, in full transparency, I am short this sucker, okay? <laughs> so I'm kind of betting that this one falls. However, there are other companies that I'm not short on that I think are also stupidly valued right now. Look at Wingstop. Wingstop's been going straight up. This is trading for an over four peg price to earnings growth measure, which is an absolutely insane valuation metric. The same is true for Costco. The problem is the market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. And just as much as I think Arm is going to collapse, I think Wingstop is going to collapse. And my real question is what companies are going to go down with these companies when they actually start crashing? Are we going to see an allocation? And this might be the copium hopium idea. Some people are really hopeful that when those start crashing, people will allocate to other stocks that have performed poorly which could be, as an example, Tesla. You know, it's up almost 4% today. That's great. But, but you know, it's just him and Han around the 200s. Who cares? That might be more copium to think that there'll be a crash in some sectors and a movement over here. Some people also think that the Magnificent Six, really, you know, everything minus Tesla, uh, will, will sort of have a little breather and pause and there won't be any kind of real downside correction. We'll see. But that's just one of the places that I'm seeing real risk. So I'm not going to babble to you for 14 minutes about, oh my gosh, March 11th, mark your calendar for March 11th, or, you know, and, and all of a sudden the bank term in front of you. It'll probably end. In my opinion, nothing will happen. If anything happens, just recognize the Fed will just open up the facility again. They never said they can't reopen the facility. <laughs> the Fed's just going to bail that out again. And don't get me wrong, it's all rigged. Yeah, I, I think there are problems. Consider the inverted yield curve. We're now negative 44 basis points inverted. It is worsening. We were talking about that at ehack.com this morning, uh, where we're talking about how the inverted yield curve is worse than where it was most of the beginning of the year. We were like 20 to 30 basis points inverted. Uh, but the problem is you don't have the recession yet. You look at uh, uh, Bank of America's fund manager survey. You've got 41% of fund managers uh, think there won't be a recession in the next 12 months. 21% of those who do think it'll be next quarter and another 20% think it'll be the next quarter thereafter. So in other words, in the next seven months, you've got about 40% of fund managers who think we'll be in a recession. The problem is we've essentially printed our way out of a recession for now. We've probably just kicked the can down the road. That's probably why we have an inverted yield curve. We might be in a recession in 25, 26. Think about it. The AI bubble growth slows. You don't get that growth contribution anymore. The fiscal spending goes away from a Biden administration throwing money at the CHIPS Act and Inflation Reduction Act, potentially, you know, over $1.3 trillion per Goldman Sachs estimates because of loose treasury interpretations of the rules. Basically, massive, massive corporate welfare and stimulus going to the richest, right? It's, it is rigged. I like, I don't want, I'm not making this video going, no, that person's wrong. It's not all rigged. No, no, no. I, I agree. It's rigged. I just don't think the bank term funding program is what you got to pay attention to. These valuations are you pay attention to. You pay attention to the fact that the two year treasury is four, seven and the tens like four, six, uh, or sorry, um, uh, four, two, six. So, you know, that's, that's an inverted yield curve. That's worsening. You pay attention to the spike of inflation we had in January, which even if that spike is transitory, that's a nasty word to use, but I think January was heavily exposed to seasonal uh, inflationary impetuses. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not horribly worried about that as a catalyst. I am horribly worried about the next bubble, and that is multifamily real estate. 
Now you have to be really careful in this one, okay? So just type into Google, do it with me. Mortgage uh, delinquency multifamily. So Wall Street Journal mortgage delinquency multifamily. This is what it looks like. You just go to the first click right here. Uh, and this article is what you should be concerned about. Uh, the gist of it basically is that you had 0.9% of multifamily apartment buildings that were delinquent, uh, sorry, 0.4%. Let me make sure I have that right. 0.4%, yeah, there it is. As of January, 2023, 0.4% uh, of, of um, uh, some of these collateralized loan obligations were delinquent 30 days or more. That was up 20X in January of this year. And you're seeing this not just at Arbor, but across the board, you're seeing delinquencies across the country in multifamily real estate, specifically in the Sunbelt area, explode. There are uh, multifamily-based companies that all they do is multifamily and sun-based, and they're selling for a fraction of potentially what they're worth. Why? Because of oversupply of new construction, rents coming down, and loans coming due. There are a lot of multifamily home builders, that includes developers, uh, and owners that have loans coming due. They don't have the benefit of a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. Now, does that mean housing is going to come down, single-family homes and condos? Maybe not, because of the benefit of the lock-in of the 30-year mortgage. But multifamily is seeing massive opportunities. Mismanaged buildings and loans coming due create opportunities for companies to go buy. That's what we're doing with House Hack. Well, we, we may have gotten lucky with timing because we really started buying in Q3 of last year. And, uh, and, and we see the problems worsening uh, while valuations on single family have been stable or up, which that's what we started buying. Now here in the spring, we're like, okay, shortage of single family has gotten worse. Most single family hits April, May. So let's wait again to buy in single family until April, May. Where's the biggest pain right now? Multifamily. So where are real bubbles coming in March? It's not the bank term funding program. That's fugazi. That's nonsense. It's probably not an unemployment recession either at this point. I think, uh, you know, when we look at uh, layoffs as in terms of how many layoffs we've been having, yes, we had a lot of layoffs in January, but frankly, it's a fraction of what we've seen at the end of 2022 and the beginning of 2023. Probably not an unemployment recession. JP Morgan says the biggest concerns we need to have going forward are negative jobs reports. Not really seeing that right now. Maybe negative retail spending, but thanks to buy now, pay later, we're not really seeing that right now. An inflation spike beyond January feels unlikely right now. Uh, to me, the bubble is much more clearly uh, in particularly overvalued stocks. Costco, Wingstop, Arm. Arm, I think, has the greatest likelihood of popping in March. Uh, followed by multifamily real estate. And I think that's not so much of a devastating 08 style crash. It's more of an opportunity. Reason for that is the stability that single family gives you. Uh, money that would go into investing in single starts going in multi, it balances out. And so when you take advantage of the higher cap rates you get in multi, you start getting some balancing effect. That's our opinion, that's our take. But no, is it the bank term funding program? Look, it's a great clickbaity video that says, yes, everything's gonna collapse March 11th. Uh, I don't think so. That's for bank, the bank term funding program. Uh, I do think it's worth noting this chart as well, which is why I pulled it up, that who's paying most of the interest today? Remember, most people think that high interest rates are gonna slow the economy. Let's be real, high interest rates are benefiting the richest companies that exist. Every single quarter since we've started seeing uh, interest rates increase over here in Q2 22, interest that companies have had to pay has collapsed every single quarter from here straight down. That's because companies are cash rich. They're the ones buying the AI chips or whatever. They're taking the high interest rates. They're earning the high interest rates. On the flip side, it's smaller businesses and people like you and me who are paying the higher interest rates. We're suffering with those higher interest rates. So the Fed's doing a really good job at putting the, the boot on the back of the neck of the people, not of the big rich corporations. And so those are the places I think to look for a crashy doodla oopsie doopsies. Anyway, if you like the perspective I share, my buy sell alerts, check out my uh, courses over at meetkevin.com. If you want to invest in Househack because you're an accredited investor, go to househack.com 2024 to learn more about our fundraise. Might be the last one we do 
If our plans work out this year, we might not ever have to fundraise again, so it'll be pretty cool. So check that out, househack.com slash 2024. And uh, thank you so much. I'll post more updates over at ehack.com. Thanks for watching. Goodbye. Why not advertise these things that you told us here? I feel like nobody else knows about this. We'll, we'll try a little advertising and see how it goes. Congratulations, man. You have done so much. People love you. People look up to you. Kevin Pafrath there, financial analyst and YouTuber. Meet Kevin. Always great to get your take. Even though I'm a licensed financial advisor, real estate broker, and becoming a stockbroker, this video is neither personalized financial advice nor real estate advice for you. It is not tax, legal, or otherwise personalized advice tailored to you. This video provides generalized perspective, information, and commentary. Any third-party content I show should not be deemed endorsed by me. This video is not and shall never be deemed reasonably sufficient information for the purpose of evaluating a security or investment decision. Any links or promoted products are either paid affiliations or products or services which we may benefit from. I personally operate and actively manage ETF and hold long positions in various securities, potentially including those mentioned in this video. However, I have no relationship to any issuers other than HouseHack, nor am I presently acting as a market maker.